And uh, I'd like to introduce the speaker. Um, Petrus uh, Kumustakos is a professor at Harvard School of Engineering uh, and Applied Sciences. He's also the faculty director of the Institute for Applied, for Applied Computational Science and the chair of the Department of Applied Mathematics. Uh, he studied naval architecture, aeronautics, and applied mathematics at Athens, Michigan, and Caltech, uh, respectively. Uh, served as the chair of computational science at ETH Zurich. Um, elected the international member to the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, uh, several other societies and awards. Um, his research interests are on the fundamentals and applications of computing and artificial intelligence to understand, predict, and optimize fluid flows in engineering, nanotechnology, and medicine. So please all join me in welcoming Petrus. Thank you very much, Roy, for the kind introduction. It's uh, great to uh, uh, visit even virtually UCI. There's many great friends that I know over the years. I met uh, Pierre and Patrick from our time in, uh, at Caltech, and then I met again at Caltech Eric. Uh, so lots of great memories and, and people that I know, and I have uh, interacted in various capacities. Um, so today I'll be telling you um, some work that I have been doing over the years, um, and uh, I have been uh, trying, I have been having different uh, successful and successful attempts to uh, uh, try to create interfaces between numerical methods and um, machine learning for solving um, problems in science and engineering. And as the time evolves, I think we have better and better tools to try to create um, these alloys, as I call them, alloys of artificial intelligence and computational science. And I think these are um, two very potent uh, components that can make a, a great tool for uh, discovery and prediction for complex systems. Um, um, what are complex systems? Uh, I think we are all familiar uh, with them. Um, complex system is uh, the climate. Uh, it involves multi-scale and chaotic dynamics. Um, we are thinking about ocean currents uh, that we would like to uh, forecast. Uh, we're interested in uh, turbulence that we like to control. And also complex systems appear not only in the macro scale world, but also in the nanoscale world when we are talking about proteins and we are interested in how can we understand their folding. So um, what are, uh, from the perspective of, of computation, these systems, they, we can write equations for them, but very often the equations that we write, they are very um, expensive. They are very expensive to simulate the systems. We don't have either the spatial or the temporal uh, resolution to do so. And um, what we try and what we are interested in are their methodologies that we can develop so that we can forecast um, uh, system dynamics and are there tools that perhaps we can use that we can forecast um, things that go from the scales that climate has down to the scales that uh, proteins are experiencing. So uh, of course people who work in these fields they have not been idle and there's a lot of great work uh, for example in turbulence people are working with techniques that they call larger dissimulation, where they try to work with more core scale um, dynamics of the turbulent flow and then the fine scales that they can resolve then they model. Uh, there is also surrogate models that people are trying to discover for one application or another. And for molecular systems, there's techniques like coarse grain models of molecular systems where you don't resolve all degrees of freedom, maybe you ignore the water, around the protein and maybe you do some more, um, some further simplifications and you try to uh, create uh, predictions. So we have made progress and uh, all I argue is that given advances that we have in AI, we can even make uh, further and more powerful progress if we put together what we already have from our understanding of what may work in um, numerical methods and, and, and what can we get from artificial intelligence and combine um, the two. Now, um, one other thing that is becoming very important is the way that we are using computers coming from the field of simulations. One way to view computers is that you're giving them certain instructions, you take equations, discretize them, and then you tell them what to do. And that's usually what you try to do when you have a simulation. But now there is a, a different way that one can view computers. You can see computers as a way of um, specifying goals, and then you let 
the computer and of course the algorithm that goes with it to do some uh, discovery uh, for us without us specifying uh, what is this particular discovery, but we're just specifying an, an upper level uh, goal. So what are some of the goals that we would like to have? Um, one of the things that we wish is we would like perhaps to learn um, what is the effective dimensionality of a complex uh, system. Are there techniques that we can use for that? Um, we are interested, of course, to predict um, the complex uh, systems. And the question is at what level and what granularity would like to do that. We're interested to optimize and uh, we're interested to, to control and to model, as I will add there, um, later. I'll be talking about the three um, parts here. So they will see three parts in my presentation and I will explain how I go about that. So I'd like to say one more word about computers. Um, and this is the computers that I experienced in my life. And, and this is, I put there 2017 because this is the last time that I actually touch the supercomputer myself. I think it's my students that they do all the work now. But nevertheless, if you look at what has happened between uh, 1981, which was the first supercomputer, well, first computer that I touched, we were using cards and everything in Athens to one of the biggest computers we had in Switzerland, there is a, a speed up of about 1 trillion. And that's an incredible technology um, to, uh, to have in our disposal. Of course, this technology has not been unnoticed, and I think this technology is also what uh, fuels a lot of the things that are happening in artificial uh, intelligence. And one of the perspectives that I like about artificial intelligence uh, is one that comes from some economists. They wrote this book, Prediction Machines, and what they argue is computers have made arithmetic cheap, and now solving complex equations is done more easily and in less time. Indeed, we can solve complex equations more easily and in less time, but we still cannot solve equations to the times that um, we would like them to be uh, meaningful. Um, and, and what is interesting, the perspective of these people is what will AI technology make cheap? They will make cheap is prediction, and they are interested that prediction is central to decision making, and that's actually um, uh, an opportunity for all sorts of markets and, and companies. So how does this, um, I, I, I totally agree with all these statements. Uh, I think uh, we still need to work on the part about um, solving complex equations and I will show you the limitations. But the other thing I'd like to show you is when I first started to work in uh, machine learning was when I went for my postdoc at Stanford and I started trying to, I took a class in computational psychology by David Rumelhart, um, the late David Rumelhart. And then I started working in fluid mechanics and machine learning and people were telling me, well, all this thing is dead. Why do you bother? In any case, uh, back in 1999, I wrote a, a review, a mini review article that appeared only in the proceedings of the lab. Nobody will bother to publish this, but there are some interesting things that we did back then. We applied machine learning and experimental systems. And then we were applying at that time in experimental systems because for computation, it was, it was really difficult. And, and what I can tell you, at least for some of the neural nets I was using, um, what it would take about three minutes, I have put here 2019, uh, it would have taken a year back in 1997. The speed up that you see here is the speed up that we have from the different supercomputers. Uh, this is the top uh, supercomputer in the world. And I think this is the average, uh, this is the total power that we have. This is the top supercomputer. And this is the number uh, 500. And, and, and I put these two um, th points here. This is a, a review article that I uh, wrote recently, Machine Learning for Fluid Mechanics. Um, and, and now everybody seems to be citing this article. Nobody cites that. And, and I think one of the reasons is this speed up that we got from the computers that has made machine learning uh, possible. Now, of course, it's not only computers. And uh, like, let me start by showing you some of the work we have been doing in uh, dimensionality reduction. Um, so again, uh, this is uh, uh, David Rumelhart, and I was going and taking his class in computational psychology back then. And I was uh, going and I was seeing this backpropagation algorithms. And I was saying, isn't this the chain rule of differentiation? And then he was explaining to me what is different. So I, I, I very much learned a lot of things back then. And I tried, I was fascinated by the ideas and I tried to use them in fluid mechanics. 
So in fluid mechanics, one of the prominent methods in our field uh, was always something that in, in our field has is in fluid mechanics is called proper orthogonal decomposition. For people from computer science, this is nothing more than linear principal component analysis, uh, but it's proper orthogonal decomposition sounds better for fluid mechanicians. So when you are a fluid mechanician, what you do is you take the data, uh, you create a covariance matrix, and then what you're looking is you're looking to solve this problem of the covariance matrix, and then you find the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, and then you can retain the most meaningful eigenvectors, and that's how you proceed. The question that I had at that time is what happens if this is not enough? And, and also the other thing that I was finding out is that when you look at neural nets, instead of having these mathematics that may not be easy to generalize, I found fascinating that in neural nets, you have an architecture and, and then you take an input and you pass it through some linearity and then you have an output. And, and then of course, what was fascinating to me was to discover that you can take uh, at that time that you can take uh, the a neural net and actually express the proper orthogonal decomposition or linear principal component analysis in terms of a neural net. Uh, I guess you all know that you need an activation function that is linear. And, and what is fascinating now is that you have an architecture that is solving uh, the same problem, except that now this architecture, you can do other things like you can introduce nonlinearity into the weights. So while this thing here, the POD or the classical PCA may not be easy to translate into a nonlinear structure. When you're adopting the architectures of neural networks, you can um, put it in a nonlinear um, structure. Also at that time, I was actually uh, reading the paper of Pierre. That was my first time, I think, that I interacted in science with Pierre. Uh, I think we knew at Caltech, but never talked about science, that's a pity. Uh, and I, I was very much appreciative of his work on um, learning from examples without local minima. So I, I learned from that paper that it was possible indeed to try to find a mapping between these two um, ways of doing dimensionality um, reduction. So um, of course now we're going and you can have non-linearity and then this is uh, a paper that was published in 2002 after going through reviews over about five or six years and being rejected left and right. Uh, basically, what this paper was doing was challenging the dogma of the POD that existed in fluid mechanics and was showing that, uh, so here is some original um, flow field that we have. And if we keep um, uh, the same number of modes that would correspond to a, a specific uh, neural net and then you're using a neural net, then the reconstruction that we will get with a neural net was much, much better than what you would get from the POD. These are some segments of a flow field. You can imagine them as vertical structures in the flow field. Um, go ahead, there is a question or... And the two pictures, this is one of the best cases that we got a very good reconstruction. And this is one of the worst cases that we got a reconstruction from the neural nets. But overall it was, it was very, very uh, powerful and it was showing that there is something that we can do uh, in neural nets. We were interested to reconstruct the flow above the wall by using only measurements uh, on the wall. Um, now, um, this work, uh, we um, many, many years passed. We did a lot of things when I moved to Switzerland. Actually, I happened to meet um, uh, Jürgen Smithhuber and Jürgen introduced me to the LSTM at that time, and um, that was quite an interesting thing. Actually, we wrote a proposal, uh, me and Jürgen, to the Swiss National Science Foundation about using LSTM for fluid mechanics, <laughs> and, and he was completely rejected, uh, calling it nonsense. But anyway, it's a, that, that's, that's the things that you go through. I'm, I'm still, I think I could still be very proud about this uh, work we did with Jürgen. But so more recently, um, we have revisited um, some problems in dimensionality reduction and prediction for complex systems using uh, recurrent uh, neural nets. So I'll try to tell you a little bit uh, about um, uh, this work. <clears throat> so we are interested in recurrent neural nets and uh, we're interested to see whether recurrent neural nets can help us uh, predict uh, the evolution of a particular system. Uh, so here, the particular system, it's one benchmark that people have in complex systems. It's called the kuramoto shivashinsky equation. It's a model of diffusion instabilities in laminar flame fronts. 
And then this equation has a nonlinearity that you see from the term here, u du dx. And there is another term uh, that controls the hyperviscosity, this new. And depending on what this new is, then you can get all sorts of different patterns. What you do in a simulation, you take this equation, you can uh, discretize it on a finite difference grid. And then uh, you are observing um, uh, situations like this, where uh, we have the x-axis here. We have the time on, uh, on uh, going up. And then as you change this parameter new, as I said, you start to get more and more uh, fine structures. So what you see here is contours of u in terms of x um, and t. So the question we had is can neural nets uh, uh, be used to predict the evolution of such a system? So what we did is um, uh, we wanted to look at the evolution of the system at some time. Let's say we wanted to look at the evolution of the system between zero and 25 and use a recurrent neural net with LSTM. And just to jump ahead, I can tell you that we failed. We were not able to take all these um, degrees of freedom that we had. We had about 512 points in the X direction and we were fitting this to the neural net, but then the RNN LSTM was not able to come to a solution. So what worked, however, was that we uh, decided to train not on the full system, but to train on a system with reduced dimensionality. So what we did is we knew how to do a singular value decomposition, a POD if you like, again, PCA. And then what we did is we created um, a, a projection of the system onto its 20 dominant singular value decomposition modes. And you can see that these 20 modes for new is equal to 0 0.1 contains about 97% of the total energy. So basically when training on this signal was not successful, we decided to train on a low dimensional signal. So this was the training uh, data. And then uh, we were uh, going back to the full system by padding our, our, um, by padding our matrices with zeros and, and, and getting the full description from the uh, SVD. So I wanna show you how successful this has been. So what you see here is, uh, is the evolution of the system. Um, and then what we did is uh, we train it and then we train up to a certain uh, way. Uh, we train in this green domain that you see here. And then I will show you how well the SVD uh, or how well the RNN LSTM were able to capture the evolution of the system at later times. So this is, uh, uh, we are training in the reduced order space, as I said, um, uh, and then uh, this is the true mode evolution. This is the, uh, the, the, the reduced uh, uh, system evolution. And then you see that if we go to about one half of the time that we have uh, trained, we're doing okay. If we go to twice the time that we have trained, we're still doing okay. And if we start to go to even further, uh, we're starting to have problems. But of course, uh, it's interesting that the recurrent neural net is able to go that far in predicting the evolution of, of a complex system. So now we started to, um, to look and we started to see what is the error that we do as we propagate in, uh, in time. So what you see here is the error, the forecasting error. So this is in terms of the modes of the SVD. So you see that initially we don't make high errors, but as time progresses, we make um, uh, more and more uh, errors. So we found that we had some success. This success was actually not necessarily um, uh, everywhere all across the board. What do I mean by all across the board? What I mean is that the more chaotic the system became, the less this RNN LSTM approach that we had was successful. And, and what we found is, for example, if you have this parameter of the hyperviscosity to be one over 10, then our system was doing okay for quite some time. And now if you change this uh, parameter to make the system more chaotic, then we found that it was all garbage after a very, 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 very fast. And we thought of different ways of how to correct this thing. But the thing that I would like to mention is that with RNN LSTMs, we're able to have some success, but this doesn't mean that all that we are doing in computational science is over and then we can replace uh, all the simulations with um, uh, recurrent uh, neural nets. Uh, how can we use, however, what we learned from this exercise? I'll show you um, a, a little bit uh, later. 
The interesting thing that I would like to mention is I found out a reference to our work in a paper um, in, a, in some um, magazine where people saying that uh, some people from the US and also they included us that we actually um, have predicted chaos uh, in a machine learning system. And very often what people do is they take a very simple ODE system, Lorenz 96 or something like that, that is supposedly a nominally chaotic system. They show that um, a machine learning can do a prediction. And then that's the end of the story that machine learning can predict chaos. What we showed is machine learning cannot predict chaos. And, and we actually collaborated with the other people that they were mentioned in this article is the group of, um, of Professor Ott, um, uh, Michel Girvan, and, and also Temi Sapsis, Brian Hart, and uh, uh, Patak from uh, Maryland and, and MIT. And we actually have a very interesting uh, comparative study where we know for what cases RNNs, LSTMs are better than reservoir computing. Um, again, um, <clears throat> depending on the dimensionality of the problem, and, and other features, you may want to choose one or the other, but definitely you cannot propagate uh, forever. Now, <clears throat> uh, is there a way that you can actually take uh, simulations and now what you have learned about um, uh, from recurrent neural nets, some of the predictions that recurrent neural nets can do and indeed uh, predict for longer times? Um, so this is a work that is, uh, should be coming out uh, this month. So um, of these things, they take time. They take years, at least for us. So what we try to understand is, um, are there some underlying dynamics? Uh, we show that with this POD and learning on the POD models, we have some success. We said, can we generalize that? Is there a way to learn the effective dynamics of, of systems? So there is a, a, a great work um, that has happened um, about uh, 20 years ago. It was an idea that was introduced by uh, my friend Yanis Kevrakidis, uh, who was at Princeton at the time, and now he's at the Johns Hopkins University. And Yanis came up with this wonderful idea. He says, OK, you have a multi-scale system, and the multi-scale system has a microstate, which is very detailed. But then maybe I can take this microstate and project it into a macro scale. Then if I do a few micro scale simulations, I get some snapshots. Um, these are expensive, but I don't run them for a long time. So if I take a few snapshots and I project these snapshots onto a, a reduced order space, then I can create numerical approximations of the evolution of the macro scale system without even having the equations for the macro scale system. All I do is I take a micro scale system, micro scale system, I average it, and then I, uh, I, I run on the average system. And whenever um, it is necessary, I go back onto the uh, full system. Now, there were a few uh, problems with that framework. And I'll tell you what were the, uh, the problems with that. Uh, so here is the, the whole thing that you do. You start at the micro scale. You go into the micro scale. You propagate in the micro scale. And then you have to find a way to go back from less information to more and close the loop and continue. <clears throat> so you do a few expensive calculations. You advance in time with much cheaper solutions. Uh, and, and, and that's how you iterate. Now, there's a few questions. Um, and, and Yanis had some successes, but there were a few open questions. The open question is, how do you go from a core scale to a fine scale? How do you integrate the macro scale? Uh, when you're doing this averaging, you're losing some of the dynamics. And some of the classical numerical integrators may not be the right thing to do. So you have to rely on memory. So um, this is something that um, I think was, was, um, uh, was an issue. And, and so the other question is, when do you decide to go from this latent space back onto the full space? So this idea of Yanis has stayed with me. I have tried to find ways to resolve it. And I think that finally, uh, by borrowing uh, ideas from machine learning, I think now we have a methodology that can revitalize this approach. And I'll try to show you some results about that. So idea number one is how do you go between fine and coarse resolutions? Well, we have autoencoders. And then um, uh, through these autoencoders, we know how to go to a latent space but also we can train ourselves, the system, to go back out into a fine space. 
when we are also interested in having some kind of stochasticity in our output, um, then the decoder in particular can be a mixture density network. This is in particularly relevant when we are looking into molecular simulations. So this was the second idea that we used. And finally, we realized that recurrent neural nets <coughs> work and with LSTM, they work in the latent space because they're able to um, maintain, to, to properly integrate the memory that you are embedding when you're doing the averaging. When you're doing the averaging, you're going away from Markovian type of dynamics. You have lost some information, but then the memory of the system is maybe what can compensate for this loss of Markovian descriptions. And, and these recurrent neural nets and with LSTM are probably a, a good way to integrate um, this uh, time series that you get in the Latin space. So revisiting Yanni's method, uh, what we did, we have a macro dynamics propagator for the Latin space, and we have restricting and averaging from micro to macro, and we have lifting using the terminology of the equation frame framework from macro uh, to micro. Uh, so this is how this whole thing works. Um, you do um, you do the microdynamics and, and you're doing some warm up period uh, where you're having fully resolved equations. Then you stop working on that. You go back and, and you collect <clears throat> different Latin space and you're preparing your recurrent neural nets. Then you're working into the Latin dynamics. You forget the simulation. So for example, in the case of the molecules um, that I will show you later, there is only one um, parameter in the Latin space instead of 24 or 25 degrees of freedom that, that I have. And there is all sorts of degrees of freedom that you get a great reduction there. And then you, whenever you need to go back, uh, you're using your decoder, um, you go back, you have a new ensemble for your microdynamics, you involve it, and then you iterate back and forth. Uh, so there's a lot of details. And as I said, there is a paper that should be coming out on that. So let's go, we tried it on the Kuramoto Sivasinski, and actually this is for one of the cases where our system was failing early on. This is the new is equal one over 16 can translate to L is equal 22, if I remember well, <clears throat> in, in another non-dimensionalization of this equation. Uh, and what we found is that previous works, they had suggested that the effective dynamics of the Kuramoto Sivasinski lie on an eight dimensional um, manifold, but learning a propagator of this dynamics is, is very difficult. Um, so what we found, I'm not sure you can see that because at least for me, do you see this plot on the right or is the video of the people on top? You see it, it's only, it. okay. Okay, let me minimize this video uh, and uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so, so what we see is actually uh, when we applied the, uh, the autoencoders, you see that the autoencoders, the, they started to saturate after the dimension eight, which was something that was theoretically predicted uh, a long time ago, while the PCA, um, they were much less accurate in trying to create a reduced order representation of the space. So then we apply, so now it's interesting to see what is the evolution. So this is the full system on, on, on the left. This is how it would evolve if I do only um, a micro scale description. Now, this is how the Latin space is evolving, and this is what is the lead output. Uh, you can see that there is no one-to-one uh, -one everywhere accuracy, but if I look at the statistics, if I look at the, at the phase space, um, this is uh, what I predict uh, from my uh, LED, learned effective dynamics. This is what is coming out when I'm doing this. Um, uh, 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 what, 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 this is what's coming out when I do the full simulation. So. We get the statistics in, in a long term, uh, in a relatively accurate way. And, and the other thing that is important to observe <coughs> is um, the speed up that I can get. So this is a ratio between the times that I go between the mic macro scale and the micro scale. So, so I, I have a, a speed up of a factor of 10, and then you can see this is the error that I get when I get a speed up of, of 10. Of course, I can get, even higher speed ups when I work only in the Latin space by two orders of magnitude, but then the errors that I get are much larger. So there is always a trade off of how fast uh, you want um, the, the time stepping, uh, how much do you, 
use these micro scale simulations in the context of the LED. Uh, another thing, we applied this also in flows behind a cylinder. So this is the reference solution. This is the prediction. What you're looking at is vorticity. The error is not uh, very significant in terms of the uh, vorticity. And then you can get an order of magnitude uh, speed up. For those of you who are fluid mechanician, you will say, and very correctly so, Reynolds number of 100 is not really challenging, and I agree with you. Uh, we put it there because we wanted to compare with other people who present things um, with um, um, uh, at this Reynolds number. Um, so, so we find actually that uh, we we see how we can trade um, speed up with the error uh, that 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 we are making again. And the other thing that I want you to pay attention, you may see that the vorticity field actually you more or less capture it. But the interesting thing is to see if you're interested for another quantity like the drug coefficient, then um, you have actually a, a, a more clear benefit. So, so coarse grain features like drug is captured very, very well by this approach. Now, we take and we put the Reynolds number to an order of magnitude up. Um, we now do it in, 10, in, in 1,000. I think this is one of the few, probably the only time that someone, I think, has done it at this Reynolds number with using this um, uh, reduced order representations. You can see the prediction and the reference are not so uh, good anymore. Uh, and I will tell you what is uh, the story. The story is that as the as the Reynolds number is increasing, the key dynamics are happening around the surface of the body. So all the methods are actually will be suffering unless you do something to capture the dynamics that are happening around the surface of the body. So you do get uh, some improvements. Um, this is uh, the drug coefficient. You still have some uh, accuracy, but you are not uh, as good as you were for 100. And I think what this thing tells you is that you need to pay attention to the physics and spend more time in figuring out the near wall uh, dynamics. Nevertheless, I wanted to show you some comparisons. There's different techniques. Um, there is a, a technique by my, my friend Stephen Branton called Cindy. Um, and there is a, a, some other techniques um, that, uh, that uh, exist around. We compare with Cindy, and you can see that these are log plots. So, so we find out that the error uh, when you apply it to Reynolds number of 100 or Reynolds number of 1,000, uh, the error of the technique that we have presented, uh, especially when you use LSTMs, uh, we are about an order of magnitude uh, better in terms of the accuracy and, and definitely um, um, uh, comparatively um, very, very fast. Another application, because this thing is not only for fluids, another thing that we looked is uh, evolution of a small molecule. It's called analine T-peptide. And then this molecule, sometimes people describe its behavior by looking at these two angles and how these two angles are behaving. So these two angles, uh, they have different conformational landscapes and areas where they would like to exist. So the question is, can this LED visit all these different uh, areas? The answer to that is that it does, and, 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 but not all of them. So first of all, you go from 24 degrees of freedom to one of degree of freedom. And this is the landscape, the correct landscape that is captured by molecular dynamics. And you can do that because you can afford, it's a small system, so you can afford to do that for very, very long times. And you see here now where LED is actually failing, you see some places where there is not enough data uh, for it to sample the space. So some of these areas we fail, some other areas though, we are able to capture. So if you look at it, so here is a particular conformation um, where we're looking at the area C5, which is area over here. And you can see that there is a small error uh, between what the LED is doing versus the full MD data. There is the area that they call P2, which is over here. And again, there is a very Good accuracy, but again, there is other areas like the AL and C7 AX, as they call it, where we are not as good. Another thing which is interesting is to to see actually um, that uh, when we are that we are able to capture the free energy uh, in the latent space uh, quite accurately between the lead and, and and the reference, and then we only need uh, just one degree of freedom, which is the degree of freedom in the latent space that we're using, and these are uh, the different. Uh, uh, this is this shows you that the different minima of this free energy is the different areas that we have been able uh, to capture um, through the LED. 
Now, moving on um, to another place where I think there is a great interface between learning and, and, um, and fluid mechanics and complaint systems, and this is to use AI to do uh, control. So one of the things that I was always uh, very interested, we are observing things in nature, and, and so there is this little bug here, and this little bug um, all of a sudden has a problem. And so the question is, how do you solve this problem? So what this guy does is he goes and he tries very hard. The, the full movie is three minutes, eh? but I have edited down to a few seconds, I think. So you see, he's trying very hard. At some point, he almost uh, gets it. Um, uh, but then he's going to totally miss um, the point. So he tries to uh, go the other way. Uh, and, and there it just doesn't know what to do with that. But long story short, uh, this uh, little bug is able to solve this problem. Uh, and after a, a certain ordeal, this is a great movie, Microcosmos. So he's able to get the dirt ball and go. So is this intelligence? And, and there is other manifestations of intelligence. There is the definition of intelligence by John McCarthy as a computational ability to solve goals. Uh, what you have here is you have some insects that when you throw them, they're able to use their body to glide and find a place to land in the uh, rainforest. You have other animals that they learn how to interact with vortices beside, uh, behind a certain body. And, and then you see these two fish there uh, that I shot with my iPhone. Uh, they go together. I mean, wh why do they do what they do? Uh, as there are some energetic benefit to things like that. So this is uh, another old hobby of mine. This is reinforcement learning that I'm sure many of you know. I, I just found there is an interesting relationship between reinforcement learning and Harvard. And, and this is through the work of Burus uh, Skinner. The two uh, pigeons are at the other end of a small ping pong table. She was an uh, animal uh, um, psychologist, if you like. So that says that if me and Patrick, we have played soccer enough, maybe we would have learned how to play, but there's other parameters there. Uh, anyway, uh, so there's uh, uh, reinforcement learning has a, a long history um, in psychology, mathematics, economics. And, 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 and of course, there's a lot of attention recently that has come out in, in games. Um, uh, so uh, what, 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 what can we offer here? What can we add to all these great things? Well, this reinforcement learning is actually slowly being applied to complex systems. And one of the things about reinforcement learning is uh, when you're observing the system, for example, in the case of the Atari um, game, you need all the information for all the pixels. If I take that in a flow system, that would mean that I would have um, uh, not only a 2D, I will have a 3D uh, game where uh, I will need to pay attention to grids of the size of a million by a million by a million and over many, many, many millions of time steps. So the amount of data that I may have would be uh, 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 incredible uh, and, and my reinforcement learning may not be so successful. I will not have enough compute time to do anything. Of course, you start to have um, interesting things where you start to be careful about what you um, observe. Uh, but um, <clears throat> now let's look at what work has happened in, in fluids. So it has happened in the last few years. There is some work where people are starting to uh, apply reinforcement learning to control the aerodynamics of, of drones. So there's great work by Sinjowski and his collaborator and Fergasola and Reddy. Um, there are people who have done um, some particles uh, that they're trying to travel them to make them travel in flows. So I have to say we were some of the first that we started working on this um, uh, about 10 years ago when we were trying to teach some fish here um, to, to swim in a circle. Now. You can say, what's the big deal about teaching fish to swim in a circle? Well, the thing is that the fish, they interact with each other. So it's not always trivial to make them um, uh, swim in a circle. We also looked at agent-based models where agents now, they have strong hydrodynamic interactions. So you have the Reynolds model where you get schooling to happen, but the Reynolds model does not have long range interactions between the agents. If you start to put dipole interactions between the agents, the system breaks apart. 
we use reinforcement learning to be able to create, um, to get dipoles that they have long range interactions and then teach them uh, to move um, collectively and coherently. And I'll show you some of the things that we have done with more expensive uh, simulations. Uh, but before I do that, uh, okay, here is the, uh, the classical uh, perhaps way of looking at the, at the reinforcement learning. The new thing for us is that uh, we're looking into temporal systems. So a lot of the fluid mechanics that we are looking into, they have uh, time dependencies. So we're interested in using recurrent neural nets in order to represent the policies. And then what our recurrent neural nets are learning, they're learning the mean and the variance of the Gaussian. And then we're taking an action to the environment and then receive a reward. And I will give you some examples of what this thing is. So we are interested in uh, policy gradient methods uh, where we're using a stochastic estimator to update um, uh, the weights of, of our system. And the thing that we are also interested in, to, we were interested in uh, um, experience replay and we were interested in experiences in reinforcement learning and off policy learning. The idea is that you have played the game many, many times then can you use, can you do important sampling instead of uh, using uh, the current uh, online probability distribution that you're uh, exploring? Can you use, can you utilize, can you exploit the past experiences? Uh, so when we applied, uh, we took some of the uh, techniques that we found in the literature, but we found that if you, we can get them to work for games, but what works for games may not work for fluid mechanics. So first of all, the transitions can be sampled, but they may not be known analytically. Uh, also the policy and the transitions, they are time dependent. Um, this is very important in fluids. And also for fluids, every simulation, every time I do a simulation, I pay a heavy price because the samples that I have, they're expensive to evaluate. So we were very much struggling how to balance exploration and exploitation, and then how to use memories and, and experiences. So uh, what we did, uh, and, and the credit goes to my, um, to my, to my student, uh, Guido Novati, that he looked at experience replay. And then uh, Guido started thinking, well, this is something that we learned in physics, which is called important sampling. Um, so when you do important sampling, you are careful about the distributions that you use to sample from versus the distributions that you actually need to sample from. So what can happen is that you can have a policy um, that you are aiming to update, this orange one, but then uh, this is the old policy that you're bringing that is experienced by the agent. And you can have some places in your action space where the ratio between these two policies, that's a ratio you need to calculate, it can actually end up uh, being a, a number uh, that happens to be uh, very, very uh, large and that actually, um, can lower it can the importance weight can increase the variance and lower the accuracy of the way you compute uh, your cost function. The other also thing is that maybe there is a great discrepancy between the two probability distributions. So is there a way uh, to uh, control this uh, similarity between the experiences and the current updates that you do? Um, so what we did is um, we came up with this idea that appeared in ICML in 2019. We call it Remember and Forget Experience Reply, where we reject samples um, there where this ratio of the weight is outside the trust region. And then we penalize uh, probability distribution based on some form of uh, on a KL divergence uh, in order to compare experiences, this probability distribution from the experiences with uh, probability distributions uh, from uh, the actual um, sampling that we are doing uh, online for our problem. Now we compared uh, with some of the best, I believe, that I found. There is this humanoid benchmark, and then there is other benchmarks. Um, so this is the trust region policy optimization. We applied, remember, and forget experience replay on that, and then, um, to at least to my surprise, and I would be actually welcoming any uh, people who would like to check this. We found that actually we would be outperforming at least some of the techniques that we tried, uh, like uh, prioritized uh, experience replay and, and, and PPO. And then these coefficients, this is refer. So you can see the rewards that you can get with refer. These are the colorful ones. This is the humanoid benchmark. Um, uh, this is uh, an ant uh, uh, benchmark. 
I'm not exactly sure what is the three different things, right, to, to think right now. What are the different, maybe different initial conditions, but we found that there was a, a consistent um, uh, outperformance uh, in terms of the reward by uh, a factor of four and sometimes uh, five over, over the existing methods. Even more, uh, we tried the whole bunch, we tried on this uh, open AI gym uh, tasks. And the other thing that was, I found to be very interesting um, is that when you take some of these techniques that work for all these games and you try to apply them in fluid mechanics problems, this was here a particularly, this is a cylinder and there is flow behind the cylinder. And then this guy here tries to stay in place uh, none of the methods that we got off the shelf, at least, were not able to solve challenge in fluid mechanics problems. So we applied it to problems like this. And, and here is a, one of the projects that we had where we put uh, um, a swimmer uh, behind a, a cylinder, a half cylinder. The swimmer can have certain states and then it can change its motion. Uh, so the states that it has is the relative angle, the positions, and then it has some shear stresses on its body. Um, and uh, it can, what we want to find is that you want to stay in this box and you want to re re reduce your energy output. So we actually found that actually this is a, a feasible solution, similar to what animals uh, may do in nature, that this guy can slalom between vortices. Um, and then we found that this the power output, if you take this and, and you remove the front cylinder, and what you find is that this configuration actually uses 45% uh, less um, energy uh, because it's harnessing energy from the uh, cylinders in, in front of it. Now, we tried to see, uh, can we generalize? So we train at Reynolds number of 1,000, at Reynolds number of 1,200. Uh, he was able to sustain this behavior, but at Reynolds number of 2000, uh, the fluids changed. So the generalization became uh, not so possible. And then he was not able to stay in that place. We also changed the states. Um, uh, and then we found that uh, the, the choice of the states requires a lot of domain knowledge in order to make um, uh, the system uh, to work. Uh, we tried a few more things. We tried to make uh, fish to swim each other and to try to extract energy from each other. This is in the direction of fish cooling. Um, so we have a fish here that is swimming and then there is another one that is swimming in the wake. And then the first thing that we asked is uh, to the fish behind is whether it can swim aligned um, uh, with the front fish, like a peloton type of configuration. So sure enough, it could do that. Um, but uh, what we found was interesting is that you swim inside the wake of the other fish and then you still have reduced energy. Uh, so we found that we get some energy of a, a benefit of about 11% um, by swimming right behind the other fish. And now uh, we said, well, what if we actually ask that the reward is energy efficiency? And there we found actually a, another pattern, which was actually fascinating from the point of view of fluid mechanics, what the reinforcement learning found as a solution is a beautiful solution where you're learning to adapt your body curvature so that you can actually adapt to the vorticity that is coming from the fish uh, uh, that is um, in front of you. So all these things, uh, we uh, extended it to 3D. Uh, we got lots of beautiful fluid mechanics knowledge. Um, I will not get into that. These are now two fish that are swimming in 3D behind each other. Uh, uh, and, and they have learned where to swim and to extract vortices, energy from the vortices of the fish in the front. And you can actually extend it to, to more fish. These are heroic simulations because to the best of my knowledge, I think nobody has ever done two fish that are um, swimming in 3D with full Navier-Stokes equations. Here it is, full Navier-Stokes equations and reinforcement learning and energy um, uh, efficiency. And I think this would not have been possible only with reinforcement learning or only uh, with the simulations. And that's, that's an alloy that at least for me is a, is a wonderful solution. Uh, we are working with uh, our friends at Caltech um, in order to uh, extend these things into some training that they do for drones and some navigations uh, that they're applying for underwater robots. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, I'll show you one last application, which I am very excited about. 
and, and uh, I, I will conclude. The last application is the following. Um, as I said, we found that reinforcement learning is very effective in controlling fluid complex turbulent flows. So when you look at the problem of turbulence, um, uh, controlling is one thing. The other thing is that I can solve the turbulent flow with finite resources. And then uh, the scales or the physics that I cannot capture, I model. So what people do is they you have some kind of, of um, I think I forgot, I forget the things that is written on the right. So what you do is you have an equation and, and it is to zero and you decompose it into some filter quantities and some um, fluctuation terms. You plug it in there. And then what you have is you have an equation for the filter terms. These are the terms that are coarse grain and you can capture. And of course you have uh, this term over here, which is the subgrid scale modeling or the coarse grain modeling and what people do is they come up with empirical formulations um, for uh, doing um, this, uh, this technique. So this is called a Smagorinsky model, subgrid scale models. Well, the thing that we introduced was what if these models, you can learn them through uh, reinforcement learning. So you can use reinforcement learning to find closures for all types of, of different systems. Um, I will let me go a little bit faster to show you one more idea. And the one more idea here is that, yes, we can do reinforcement learning. But now, given that I have a grid and my grid points, they are discretized in the equation, what if I make my grid points to be also agents uh, for reinforcement learning? So we're starting to look into multi-agent uh, reinforcement learning. We're solving an equation uh, on a grid. You can use the grid points and you can discretize the equation. And then for the terms that uh, the subgrid scale terms, you use multi-agent learning ideas in order to find out closures for the equations uh, that you have. We're very excited about this. We have been um, using it to uh, model homogeneous turbulent flow. I will very quickly show you let me see what are the uh, results. Let me quickly show you some results here. So this is energy spectra for if there's any fluid mechanicians, the wave number here, uh, because of Guido, they were placed on the y axis. But what you see is you see that you have for homogeneous turbulence, there is something called the dynamics Magorinsky model. And, and the dynamics Magorinsky model is behaving very, very well. But reinforcement learning, like someone who does not know really much of turbulence, but knows what are the states uh, and, and the action is able to do as good as Smagorinsky by being trained in certain Reynolds numbers. And we actually found it that it generalizes to other numbers. The black line is the DNS, is the correct solution. And for the energy spectrum, and you see that this multi-agent reinforcement learning outperforms um, something called the standard Smagorinsky. The dynamic Smagorinsky was becoming unstable for this very high um, Reynolds number flows. One more thing that uh, we did is we extended it to another challenging problem. Um, and in turbulence, everybody can say homogeneous turbulence everybody gets. Well, we said, okay, let's try to solve um, the wall physics for near wall turbulence. And what we did, this is a paper with Jane Bai, who's now an assistant professor at Caltech. We learned the near wall dynamics of a turbulent flow. So we have closures um, where the near wall dynamics are being learned. They are coupled with the LES in the outer domain. Um, I will go a little bit fast here to show you um, that basically we are testing in a, in a channel flow. And, and if you were doing the testing on a quantity, which is the, the shear velocity at the wall uh, for different Reynolds number, we're going to really spectacular Reynolds numbers now. Uh, if, if you were perfect, you will be here. But what the uh, reinforcement learning does is not so perfect, but still remains within 5%. The thing that was quite surprising for us is we tested for one geometry, and then we wanted to see if we can uh, use this technique to predict um, the friction coefficient in a turbulent boundary layer. So on the right, you see results from multi-agent reinforcement learning without any training on this particular geometry, but trained in, in uh, different Reynolds numbers and in different geometries. And we found quite spectacular this uh, capability uh, of, of, um, of using multi-agent reinforcement learning for, for this. So um, I'd like to summarize what I have learned by going um, uh, through these uh, problems. Uh, for me, learning 
um, implies finding an algorithm, not necessarily machine learning, uh, that is effective for the problem that you're trying to solve. And I have an interest in flow problems because I think I can provide the domain knowledge, but extending these ideas with other uh, people who have their uh, domain knowledge, like ocean dynamics, climate would be very excited or molecules. And another thing that I'd like to appreciate uh, from this journey is that one learns a lot of things and a lot of different ways to, to see the world. Um, so there's the, the world of computational science, if you like, and then there is another world in artificial intelligence. And it should not be either or, but it should be the two of them together, these alloys that I'm arguing for, I think is a very, very potent uh, way of, of trying to solve a problem. So I like very much this idea about Skinner is that when you forget all the details that you have learned, uh, it's that, that's the education basically that you have. I'd like to thank you and I'll be happy to take any questions um, that you may have. Uh, hi Petros, uh, I have a very quick cool question. Uh, so first of all, you mentioned something about complex system. So yeah. I, I was curious to know what is your definition for complex system? Uh, because to me, like, you know, I would consider a system of systems uh, is a complex system. Uh, and then if that is true, then we are talking about like, you know, uh, the semantic meaning of the data and all this complexity. Have you ever considered that? Also, uh, have you ever looked into real time data into the simulation and learning? Well, uh, one thing at a time. So, so for me, a complex system, it's something that has multiple scales, either in space and time, and also that it exhibits chaotic dynamics. So that is my definition of a complex system. Um, and uh, if you ask me if I have looked at what, and what was the next question? Uh, so the other question that I have is, uh, how is a system of systems uh, implies in this particular uh, model or research? That is one question. And then yeah. the second one is, uh, how about a real-time data uh, mm -hmm. in the model? So I have not uh, looked into systems of uh, systems. Uh, I think this is quite an interesting um, uh, problem and, and quite exciting. I have looked at systems that they have dynamics that they will be described by one set of equations. So if you have systems of, of, of systems, that that is uh, another complexity that I have not um, thought about. I, I find it, uh, it's a very interesting idea about real-time data for, if you're talking about experimental uh, data at the moment, no, all the data that I have are simulation data. But I consider data from a direct numerical simulation of a fluid mechanics problem as real data. Um, we are looking into uh, applying these things in, as I said, into drones that are um, and, and using uh, experimental data uh, or real time data from weather and velocity profiles. And, and this is some of the collaborations we're trying to do with a group of uh, John Dabiri uh, uh, at Caltech. And then there is some other projects that I'm interested in that have to do with real-time data from, from, from wind turbines. Uh, but I am optimistic, at least on this. I mean, of course, DNS data, are, are I can manipulate them. They're, they're abundant. I can go and probe them wherever I want. The real data, they have other limitations. So, that's, so I should not be so uh, convinced that things may work. Uh, so long story short, uh, no is the nominal answer to real-time data. I'd be interested and I have hope. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, hello, Petros. Uh, Hi. Thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, so is there any reason why the learning processes here are, are not being performed over a Fourier basis or a wavelet basis where you could imagine that uh, fluid fluid behaviors or oscillatory behaviors like the molecular dynamics problems uh, could naturally be sparser? So you're asking uh, whether I should be simulating with wavelets and, and, and or what, what are you asking? Well, not simulating, but so you have the data, right? So shouldn't you go perhaps to a basis where the data yeah. is sparser before the learning process, like a that, wavelet that, or for you? Yeah, that, that's what we did uh, here. Actually, that's, that's what we did here. We, we didn't learn in the full data. Uh, 
mm -hmm. we learned in the sparser basis. And actually, that's exactly what I argue is that um, you have to learn in uh, the, for, for us, effective learning is when you find a proper basis on which to project and then you can learn. So that's exactly what mm -hmm. we have been doing. Yeah, but you're using a PCA, right? So why a PCA? This is one. Oh, PCA yeah. was okay. just the first uh, thing we did because we could do it all with neural nets. Um, so I could use my um, uh, solvers uh, and then we did it with PCA. I mean, the next thing that I showed was uh, autoencoders. Um, the thing that I do with the learned effective dynamics, here I have, um, we have uh, the, the averaging that we do, um, we have convolutional autoencoders. I can imagine that I can do wavelets. By the way, the, the numerical methods that I use are based on wavelets. Uh, where can you see that? Um, only here, actually. <laughs> if I take this movie, if you see there is a grid that is um, changing, and this is wavelet adaptive grids to solve the equation. But I have not done the training on this um, on this story on these wavelets. But yeah, no, that's that's the direction that I'm interested in. Yeah. So yeah, thanks again for for a great talk. Any more questions? I have one actually. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask about so many awesome topics, but I would like to ask about one, uh, the lifting. Um, so I think you're using the RNNs at the mac macro level, right? Not the micro That's level. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, but, 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 once you, but once you go macro, once you coarse grain, you kind of lose that Mar Markov property. Exactly. Un unless you train um, your autoencoder to somehow keep it. So if you're not doing that, how can you really lift back to micro? Well, the, the idea is that I have my, um, I, I have an encoder and I have also a decoder that is being trained here. Mm -hmm. Every time I have a snapshot, I am developing, I have an encoder and then I learn a decoder. So when I propagate the dynamics, I propagate the dynamics with RNN LSTM. And then the decoder that I have here, I, it's something that I learned here in my training and I use it to go out. Right, so you, so you, so you um, differentiate all through uh, the encoder decoder in order to be able to reconstruct the micro state again. I sample basically from my, I create some kind of an average decoder or we have different ways that we select decoders to go out into the, from the macro to the micro. That, that's so cool. Yeah, it's a, bit, it's a big problem in re reinforced learning and this method usually does not work. So I'm, I'm curious what the difference is there. We should probably chat more. The thing is, I, I think one of the things is that I don't know uh, what works in, uh, what doesn't work is in the reinforcement learning. I think here, we very often go back to the truth. I don't know if you do things like that in uh, reinforcement learning. I'll be happy to, yeah. to learn more about that uh, myself. I, I don't know if you do this flipping between uh, micro and macro in reinforcement learning. Yeah, yeah, we do. But you know, it's, a, it's a reconstruction of a high dimensional signal again that is sort of a huge burden. And it sort of takes away from, from the rest of the optimization. So maybe if, if you just focus on that, I think as you do here, maybe that's a promising direction. So another thing we, I don't know, you're using what kind of, where, when we try to go out to stochastic systems, we are also, the, the decoders that we have are mixture density networks. So we have stochastic uh, decoders that, that, uh, that we are developing. So I don't know what are the decoders that, that you are using. Neural networks, but yeah, uh, maybe the architecture matters here. I'll, I'll look into it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, on the same topic of uh, lifting and stochastic um, at the micro, I just draw the connection to uh, some of our work on dynamic Boltzmann distributions where the core scale model is a, looks like a Boltzmann distribution with differential equations for the coefficients. And then the advantage of that is that um, the Boltzmann distribution is a distribution over the microstate. And so you can project back by sampling that, that way. And um, <clears throat> of course, then, then you have the responsibility to make your 
Boltzmann distribution uh, have its own dynamics that make sense. And um, that's what we were doing for reaction diffusion systems in biology. So if there are no other questions, maybe we can take the rest offline. Um, and let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, Petros. Thank you.